Now you, you're going into Capital. Castle, and we dug in outside a castle there, and uh, there was a lot of, you know, s s action there. In fact, the Germans were s turning tanks out right out of the factory on us there. Was that? And but that evening, the uh, next morning, most of us were pretty much exhausted, and we fell asleep. Three tanks came down the road, and this fellow, John Dolan, who was hit on D-Day and was wounded six days later, came back up the 80th later on. Uh, got out, took a bazooka, and knocked three tanks out of the bazooka. Right there with inside of where you were sitting? Right in there, but we didn't. I was asleep. You know, you got your body only works so long. So was most of the guys asleep there. We had we had outposted and so forth, but but uh, he knocked out. We're trying to get him a DSC for it still the other day. And in fact, I'm working on that now. I've got some, uh, but 60 years later, it's kind of kind of difficult. Well, he knocked out the tanks with that loud noise. Did you all wake up? Did wake me up. I mean, firing was a routine thing. I mean, unless it was coming in on you. You didn't pay any attention to it. You could actually listen, know where the shells were going. Well, it's there. And once the shell came in, it didn't mean anything to you. It's routine. How far away would a shell hit that would you really notice it? I guess it would be hit within about 50 yards or so. Otherwise, Maybe 75 yards. Otherwise, otherwise you wouldn't, wouldn't worry about it. Wouldn't worry about it. Didn't have your number on it. But, uh, what else happened there, at Castle? Well, we took Castle, and and uh, I think we went. And st we stayed over in, in town of Castle. There was a Lyca factory there. Some people got whole Lycers and stuff like that there. Things like that. You mentioned that we took Castle. What was your job in the process of taking that place? Just one of the guys, one of the troops. Just move in in numbers, that's all. Did you, you uh, get shot at? Uh, oh, I got shot at, but yeah. it didn't hit me, so it didn't bother me. Well, yeah, you had a point there where uh, you're kind of immune to that kind of stuff, and it's, it's, a lot of people can't understand that. I mean, it's, uh, and General Bradley summed it better than anybody ever did that, with about a rifleman that, that uh, goes on day to day and to the point where he's either carried out or the war is ended. And that's how the attitude is. It's a day to day operation. It's not, you know, a hero, no brave thing. It's something that you have to do. You mentioned you wanted to try to get that guy a special award. Were there any uh, recognized heroes in your your squad that you could sit back, <clears throat> even at that time, and say, "My goodness, either this guy's crazy or he's a superhero." Well, none of us, because we didn't have what they have today, the media that they have today. There was you didn't see any correspondence up with us, and unless somebody took the time to write you up and said, "Well," Norty Murphy summed it up better than anybody else. He says, he says, I've got the awards, but my men with me deserved it as much, if not more, than I. You know. So when you were there with your squad, you didn't see any uh, necessarily uh, acts of bravery that would... Uh, no, nothing that you did would not be the ordinary that you wouldn't do. I mean, I dragged this guy to the line of fire. But it was what... I should do. There. Did you see anybody at Castle that that captured any German prisoners? No, we moved on from Castle. The infantry outfits didn't stay on. They, uh, the the uh, headquarters companies and all would come in and take over. MPs and all that. They didn't keep us in any one place. Because we moved from there out of Castle to Guerra and Gotha. And uh, we more we were in on the we liberated uh, Buchenwald, the con famous concentration camp, and uh, 
I didn't go in. Some of my friends went in. I got some pictures of it, but a couple pictures of of it. But uh, and I do remember what the stench was. It's, it was just a sickening smell from, from rotten dead bodies and all up around there. But I was just on the outskirts. I saw men like you weighing about 75 pounds. So you can just go figure yourself what you would look like at 75 pounds. And so and they couldn't eat anything because if they did, it would kill them. But then being kind to them, a lot of times, was the wrong thing that we could do, give them food or anything like that. Is that the first time you had realized the evilness of the Nazis? Or did you even realize it at the time? Well, we knew of the evilness of them because we know that uh, what they did at Melody. In, in doing the bullets when they shot all our, our men and so forth, the SS did. But I never realized the, how evil... I heard of concentration camps, but I never knew anything was like that. You know, until... And I didn't... I only saw the outskirts of it. I didn't go in. Uh, and then we moved out the next day. Where did you move then? Moved right on across to... Uh, Almost outside of Chemnitz. What did you do there? Uh, we just moved there up to that point. We did liberate a, a, a slave labor camp, but it was nothing like the uh, there. We were hit, you know, small arms fire here, there, and so forth like that. But nothing. We didn't hit anything major. Uh, up on the Audubon when we were moving up in trucks, uh, we had a machine gun open up on us out there. And the guy sitting next to me got hit in the leg, and the machine gun had to go all the way down that truck. It didn't get anybody else but him, and I was sitting next to him, and he lost his leg later on. Oh, my name is Glenn Sadler, Sergeant Sadler. But medics were there, treated him right away, but they still couldn't save his leg. But I think it must have gone, hit an artery. Did you have to jump out of the truck when it Oh, yeah, we shot? all jumped out of the truck and got down behind an embankment. Then we sent out, a, uh, I believe, a, a platoon out to get that. Uh, it wasn't our platoon because we got hit there. So, and from there, from Chemnitz, right side of Chemnitz there, which we didn't go. That's where the uh, what's the name of the river there that the Russians you met? The Oder? No, it wasn't the Oder River. I can't think of the name. Well, it's a famous river that runs through there where we met the Russians. Were you there at that day? No, I didn't meet them. I didn't. I, we swung us south down through Bamberg and Nuremberg and uh, and on through uh, to Austria, where we finished up the war. One thing, interesting thing in in uh, Nuremberg, we taken the town it was pretty secure and everything else, and we laid over there and we sort of patrolled it. But we got a shower, first shower I got from, since December '44. How did you stay? Well, probably didn't stay too clean, but well, how? you kept yourself as clean as you could. You, you would take what we call horse baths. Take the steel pod, and uh, if we took a little country town or something, they had these cook stoves with water jackets, hot water jackets. We heat hot water in those and put it in the pod and wash off the best we could. Uh, we didn't get any change of clothes or anything, but that's we always had a change of socks. They made sure of that, but. Uh, I don't recall getting any other changes until, uh, until about April 45. How uh, much marching did you do versus riding in trucks from battle to battle to place to place? Most of it was marching, walking. We didn't uh, ride too much. How about food? Where did you get your food? We carried K rations with us and wherever we stopped if uh, the kitchen could catch up with us. The kitchen would uh, come in and cook for the company. 
And then you would line up in a line and go through the kitchen line? Right. But we'd go back and buy squads or platoons or whatever. Nobody, everybody went back at one time. And then we carried K rations with us and they had a breakfast, dinner, and supper in the K rations. Where did you sleep most of the time? Well, <laughs> in the ground, someplace where we can find. Usually it was on the ground or was it in houses or sheds? Well, or? in places we were in town, we took a town, it'd be in the houses. If not, it'd be wherever we could find a place to sleep. Was there any time that you had to eject a civilian family so that your folks could uh, have no, a place? they weren't to there when we got there. Most of the civilians were gone. Was um, there any civilians that you came across that uh, that were destitute? No, I never noticed anything like that. See, we hit so fast. An infantry outfit didn't linger. People coming in behind us, the uh, military government people and MPs and so forth, then then the people started coming out of their basements or wherever they were hiding and so forth into the towns. They saw this. We didn't. There. The civilians were all hiding. Then. We're really hiding with it away from you. Was there any time that a, a civilian played a pivotal, uh, important part in the battle? That, none, that I know. none that you saw. Mm -hmm. um, as you can, you continued across from Belgium to into Germany. Um, did you notice how destroyed the landscape looked like versus? Belgium, let's say, from southern Germany? Well, the landscape you notice from the time you went across France and so forth right on through. In some of the towns we went in, there wasn't anything hardly left of the town that had been totally destroyed. Uh, and, you know, there in the in the 45 period there, we started sending a thousand planes over these cities. Did you see these big air, air armadas at any time? You didn't see them. You could hear them go across. They were too high up to see. And, yeah. we, we typically think of the American soldier as more moralistic than, than the enemy. Was there any times that you saw our soldiers do reprehensible things? I know of the situation. I didn't see it. There. Yeah. You know, it's a you hear a lot of stories like that. And, and I know a situation where, where our soldiers actually shot two Germans. Yeah. But we saw them the next day. We didn't know who did Soldiers it. Or, or civilians? Soldiers. It's out of revenge, though. But, I mean, there's a lot of that went on. And so forth. Well, in situations, I know it. Probably you couldn't take any prisoners. You had no choice. How about looting? Oh, you, we looted. There's no question about that. Up there. It's a, uh, but we mainly took, look for stuff like cameras and war loot, like guns. You know, everybody wanted to get a Luger, which I never did. And. Uh, Almost got killed one time by a sergeant going for a Luger. What happened? Oh, uh, we outside of this town, we got orders to move up behind these artillery positions and, and clean them out and so forth. He went in there, <coughs> and we captured just one. And the sergeant was a pair of binoculars, not Luger, it was not a Luger, but a pair of binoculars hanging on the. Uh, breach of the gun, I guess, or whatever they call it. And he reached for it. When he did, it went off down to the town where our GIs were. And our lieutenant got on the phone on the radio this, don't fire back, don't fire back. Yeah. But just, so these things, I mean, the, most guys were only interested in military things as souvenirs and stuff, which then didn't mean anything to the Germans. I mean, there. Did your um, company fight against 
the best of the German Army, the SS units? Oh yeah, we hit the SS. That was the SS that opened up on some trucks, on the trucks. We, uh, we ran across up in the Arrow River route, the SS and everything. It's a. Uh, you you fought against different military units. Uh, you didn't know what you were fighting against. No. So one didn't seem worse. Well, you than find the SS. We came across a group that was really fighting. It was usually the SS. Warmark was. They were citizen soldiers, and many of them in there and didn't want to be in there. You know. It's, but uh, they had no choice, and, and they would give up more readily than the SS would give up. When you were in Nuremberg, uh, there toward the last weeks of the war, did you uh, visit the sites of the big rallies they had in the 30s? And Not that I recall. No, I didn't recall anything. Was, they had the famous uh, Wall City there and so forth, which was pretty well destroyed, which is still in existence today. My son was there about five years ago. There. Uh, did you uh, ever know that you were near any Nazi households? No. In fact, we were went through Bruno where Hitler's home was. Didn't know it. I didn't know that until way after the war was over. Before combat ended in April, late April, early May in 1945, right. um, were you uh, given any <coughs> extensive amount of time where you were off duty? Mm -mm. We, we pulled into Fegelberg, Austria. We had the Germans were coming in by the thousands to give up. They were trying to get away from the Russians. And those that got across the river there, we could give the Americans. Those that didn't get across that particular river was Russian. Uh, what the hell was the name of that river? It's a, but anyway, they. Uh, so we came in, we must have had several thousand uh, German soldiers waiting for us. What they did was to isolate about 30 or 40 of them and put them over here to the side. There was nothing we could do. They had more, 10 times as many men. They could run over top of us, but they were through. Just 30 or 40, we were told if they look cross-eyed shooting, they were the real Nazis. There. You know, what happened after that? I don't know where they went or what. You never actually captured any German, is that true? Or did you? Personally, no. no. I bought back a lot of prisoners one time, but I never personally, I know I've captured them. When you were bringing those prisoners back um, to the back lines, um, were they really dejected looking or were they yeah. just people? They were, go I think they were glad that it was over. Just like in any, uh, yeah. So a lot of people, the last big push the Germans had was the Battle of the Bulge. They made that big push. And that was pushed mostly by the SS. You know, and, uh, but, uh, and those guys couldn't turn back either. Because they had, but that's the last big push. And the last big battle and the last big fight was there at the Yarra River. Yeah, it's like little D-Day. Did you um, ever see in your unit something that was done that was just plain out and out stupid? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. Not that I can recall offhand, I guess this. Was there anything that happened that was tragic but at the same time just kind of funny? John Dolan tells a story. It wasn't tragic, but it was kind of funny. But he had been on patrol. He and a fellow by another New York by the name of Egan. He had been on patrol and got behind the German lines. And he realized he was there and he had to get back. And uh, Egan had the GIs. And, uh, and John says, Come on. He said, I can't, I can't. He says, You better get the hell out of here if you want to. Get. So they took off. And he crapped all the way on the run. So, but see, that's another thing. It was was uh, was bad. Was 
with a dysentery GI. I mean, you eat K rations and they would bind you up and you get a hot meal and that would open you up. And, you know, it's one of half of us ever had any intestines left when it was over with. Uh, you mentioned you had frostbite to the point where you went to the medic station for went to the a medics days? and they got back in the kitchen kitchen for three days to throw my feet out some hot water and so forth. How did how did you I uh, know they hurt, but uh, if you had to put a scale of pain, had you ever since been that much pain? I couldn't tell you then, you know, it was so long ago. Uh, all I know my feet were swelling. And that was it. I went from a I think eight and a half shoe to a nine and a half. So and they were swelling and so forth it was and did you wear the same uniform the entire combat experience? Or did you get replaced uniforms? No, we didn't get to replace them. We went across the Iowa River because it was freezing cold. And and then it would, the snows were melting and, and uh, everything. And I went across, and this sounds, may sound kind of crazy, but I had long johns on, uh, ODs on top of that. Uh, a sweat on t sweater and then fatigues on top of that and a field jacket and an overcoat that's how cold it was and then I s after a while you just start throwing this stuff off on the ground you get less and less as the weather got warmer but you didn't get a change was there any battle or, or skirmish that you were involved with where you ran out of ammunition or got close to running out? No, not really. But they did uh, take away a bandolier of ammunition from all of us because there was a shortage of ammunition somewhere else. So we had to turn it back in. But I understand it was something happened back in the in France, the supply depots or something. So, was there any time where your weapon jammed at the wrong moment? No. Did you carry anything for good luck? Well, I had a miraculous medal around my neck, and I carried a, uh, a small missile up here over my heart. What do you mean, a missile? A little. Uh, church missile, you know, a little Bible, I guess you can call it, there. And so that's, that's the only two things I carried, really, there. Did, I, did you do a lot of, uh, or did you do some praying at certain times? Oh, yeah. There's no atheists in the foxhole. There's the only place between that, there. It's between you and your God. There's nobody else. You uh, you went through uh, five months of combat here. Uh, was there any time when you thought that God was looking after you? I felt it. I had an angel up here on my shoulder. I called him Michael later on, and he didn't fall off, so I figured there's someplace looking. And I feel it's he's still there because I've been very blessed all the from the time you went into service in July of 44 until the war ended in May, did you see any entertainers at U.S. show shows? No. Were you given an opportunity to do no, any we touring? No, we weren't given any opportunity. We, I saw one after the war was over. Uh, you got to realize an infantryman, there's nothing between him and the enemy. They're right and like I said, the only way to get out is to be carried out or for the war to end one or the other. Did you see anybody who cracked up mentally? I saw one guy crack up yeah, right there up, up on the R River. He would walk around, he didn't know who he was or anything. Yeah. And I don't know whatever happened to him. Was there anything that you did while you were in this, in, in in the combat zone that was that could be categorized as a prank or something that 
was a prank that did that was affected you? No. So there no there were no games for you folks. No. We're just in the big game. It was serious business. Right. Oh, once I guess for thing there was down near the end of the war, you can call it a prank or a fun thing to do, but we uh, had a guy, a fellow by the name of Nick Donofrio, and Nick could do everything. He was, he was the old man. He, had fit. he was about 32 years old. The rest of us were, were left. With between, most of us were between 18 and 20. He, and he was our barber, cook. He could do anything. So we got down there in Austria, a little town, I forget, in Germany, just near the Austrian border. Uh, he said, get me some chicken. We'll fix, have some fried chicken. A fellow by the name of uh, Bobby Dodge, and we used to call him Oki. He and I went down to chicken house, the farmer. And the first time I ever seen him, he grabbed a chicken by the head and snapped the head off. And the chicken would run and then fall down. So for three or four, the farmer came out. And the farmer came out, I put my rifle at, at his belly and just told him to get his butt in. We're going to get some chicken. And we had some fried chicken that night. When the war ended, the Germans surrendered in May 7, 1945. Right. Do you recall where you were? Fagelburg, Austria. And how did you hear the news? how we heard the news. I do know that there's a little little town there which we stayed in. We got BBC on there. British broadcasting and we heard it from there. But uh, I think it was just passed down the line that it was over with. Did you celebrate? No way of celebrating. We had all these prisoners to worry about and everything. You know, a chance to celebrate or anything like that. And for us, it's just a matter it's over with. Relax. The war is over with an ETO, but the war is still going in the Pacific. Yeah. What happened after that? Well, July of 44, July of 45, rather, we went back into training, 80th Division. And we were to leave, by the way, the Suez and be the first wave to hit uh, uh, Japan, being the first wave. And they were talking about first wave, 100,000 men killed in the first wave. And you were where, in Austria still? We were in, uh, then we were in bad war show from Germany. We went back on maneuvers, we moved back out of there. And so when the atomic bomb was dropped, it saved my life from hundreds of thousands of men like me. Because the Japanese were known to fight right down to the very end. Did so, you have enough points to go home instead? No. The older guys had the points, those with families and stuff like that. I only had 37 points. So I had to wait till they got down. I had 15 points for three battle stars and then 22 points for two points for service. And you need into the 80s? Well, and they, were, they were in 75, 80, 90, and so forth. It was a. Uh, there. So you were going to get killed in Japan? Would have if atomic bomb hadn't been dropped. Also, I was, had a pretty high IQ, so they were talking about sending me back to the States OCS and uh, get a second lieutenant and then go in back over into that as a platoon leader. Knowing what you know now about the atomic weapons, do you think? that Truman made the right choice? I have no, no doubt in my mind he made the right choice. He saved a million people. Yeah. If you look at some of the bombings of Japan, fire bombings of Japan, far worse than the atomic bomb. There. And the suffering from those. But he's, we were going to hit that Japan. And if we'd have hit it, they would have fought right down to the last man. Yeah, just like they did in Okinawa and Iwo Jima and those places. Where were you on September 
1945 when the surrender happened? I was in, well, when the war, when the bomb was dropped, I was in bad war show from Germany there, which is not too far from Garmisch there. And how long did you stay in Europe before you were uh, transferred back to the States? Well, we left there, we went up to, uh, into Czechoslovakia, and uh, we had posted there along the Russian border and everything, and then from there I came back from Czechoslovakia. The outfit came back from Czechoslovakia to uh, somewhere in Germany and organized as 80th Division was put together as an outfit to come home with the High Point men. And uh, we shipped out to various engineer outfits and things like that. What what did you ship out? Yeah, I shipped into the engineers. I was in I forgot what outfits they were, but I was in one that was in Nuremberg doing the war crime trial. It was a friend of mine was a guard on the uh, this guy Jim Akery was in my squad. He was a guard on uh, on the uh, German elite there, uh, and uh, I got his story. So it's, and there we were guarding a prisoner of war cage. There, there's another crazy prank or whatever. And this was that we always had a keg of beer, and uh, they brought us out a whiskey rash. And I don't know why in the hell they ever did that. And I still even to this day. So these guys get pretty well stoned anyway. This fellow, Joe 